what kind of things happen just in reality with respect to that first level of intrusion, which is called? An articulable reason. An articulable, mm -hmm. And I think before I get into what can happen, everyone should understand that no one is obligated to answer those questions put to them by a police officer at that level. So you mean if a, if a police officer walked up, walked up to me and said, uh, what are you doing here? I'm not obligated to answer that question. That's right. So by what law, would happen? Okay, by law you can walk away. And I think we all know in reality if you attempt to walk away, is immediately the officer is going to stop you, probably put his hands on you, or at least order you verbally not to move. Well, in that first level of intrusion, uh, which is a request for information, if I don't want to give that police officer any information, how, can you give me any suggestions as to how I should conduct myself? Well, I would suggest that you respectfully say, I don't care to answer that, and keep walking. And you mean like I should go, I don't care to answer that officer, and just walk away? That, that's correct. You know, we could get into reality here, right. and the reality is simply this, and, and I, it, it's terrible. But if I was walking down the street at four in the morning with a bag over, over my shoulder with a TV in it, the chances of a police officer coming up to this white face mm -hmm. and asking intrusive questions, even like, what's your name and where are you going, are very minimal. And if a police officer did that, and I said, officer, with all due respect, under the law, I do not have to answer you. Okay. I'm talking about racism here. Okay. You'd make out much better. Right. That if I Shank did the same right. thing. Because if Shank did it, and I, you know, I want to be perfectly frank, and, and it's pathetic. But if you did it, I don't know. You know, it depends on the officer. If he was having a bad day, you'd probably be having a bad night. Right. And it's, it's terrible. It sucks, frankly. Um, in, the, in the second level uh, of intrusion, why don't you give the audience a little... Okay, the second level is a common law right to inquire. Now, the Holman decision differentiated between these two levels very specifically. The questions that an officer can ask under the request for information is name, is destination. Under a common law right to inquire, the, the predicate is a found, founded suspicion that criminality is afoot, and the questions can get more intrusive and even accusatory. For example, um, what are you doing in this neighborhood? Where are you going? What's in the bag? How did whatever, that looks like a TV in there. Is that a TV in there? What's in the bag? Can I look in the bag? And notice my tone of voice and the, and the, the uh, words in the questions are more than just what's your name and where are you going. This is a common law right to inquire. And again, under that, um, the, the person who's being asked questions does not have to answer and can walk away. Can I, I want to interject because I realize one of the reasons that it's so difficult for most of us to get the distinction between those two is most people, at least in my neighborhood, never see the first level. <laughs> That's right. Okay. We're only familiar with that second level, that harsh tone and all of those accusatory type questions. Whereas Steve is much more likely to hear that first level of inquiry. Right. Now, when you hear that, that second, uh, that, that's when you confront that second, second level of inquiry, uh, any suggestions as to how to deal with that second level of inquiry? And also, you know, what, what might prompt the police officer to do that? What, uh, when is he justified uh, in doing it? In, in a little more detail, but what might the person do? Well, if he has some factual basis to think that something's out of line, he can ask those questions, okay? Now, how might that factual basis Well, if he sees rise? the television through the pillowcase. No. All right. Of but that, of course, now, anybody can carry their television. That doesn't mean that it's not their television, maybe belongs to somebody else, okay? So, 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 he, so I've got this television, I'm walking at four in the morning, and he mm -hmm. comes up in this second level inquiry, inquiry and uh, I just say, oh, sir, you know, I, I, I just have to go. Right, and well, what he's gonna say to justify going, get to the third level, which we'll talk about in a minute, is, oh, this is a high crime area. We have a lot of reports of burglaries, right? There's been a lot of burglaries recently and it is four o'clock in the morning he works this area all the time and you don't look familiar okay. all of those reasons will be given to justify um, moving his 
interference with your liberty to the next level. What are some common reactions that people have at the first and second level of inquiry that people should not do? Well, that's a great question. Okay, people usually get very indignant. Uh, a lot of times people will swear at police officers. Not a good thing to do. So let me just clear this up. Police officer comes forward to me. What you got in the bag? I don't have to tell you what I got in the bag. What's up with you, man? Just walking. Yo, what's up with that? That's that's a guaranteed arrest. A and, guaranteed. And maybe yeah, maybe even uh, in addition to the arrest. A head split. Right, a head right. split. So what you would suggest in a situation like that is at least something calm without the voice raised. Uh, Don't move into stereotype mode. Right. That's the first suggestion that I can make to people. Don't do what the cop is stereotypically expecting you to do, which is why he came at you in the way he did in the first place. And don't volunteer any information that can be used against you. You know, you have the right to remain silent. Now, I know this is a Fourth Amendment training, but the Fifth Amendment says you have the right to remain silent. So if the, if the police officer asks, what's in the bag, can I look in the bag, you are fully within your rights to say, no. officer, with all due respect, I do not have to open this bag. My name is Stephen Scott, and I, I live at this address, and I wish to exercise my Fifth Amendment right to a lawyer right here. Are you arresting me? That's one of the questions you mm -hmm. can ask. Am I free to leave? The cop yep. may ask you, do you have any identification? You are not obligated to show it. Well, let me get this straight. What you're saying is that in New York City or New York State, you are not obligated to show identification. That's correct. So if, if a police officer came up to me and said, do you have any identification, and I just didn't say anything, mm -hmm. I'd be well within my rights. You're within your rights. What the officer more than likely will do is find an excuse to arrest you, and then later on claim that the reason he arrested you is because you didn't show any identification, and then come up with some charge to charge you with. But not showing identification in it's itself is in legal. itself totally legal is legal now you i'm not talking about if you if you're stopped in a car and you're asked to show your driver's license that's right. different but if you're on the street you have no obligation to show identification you have so no obligation to carry identification so a person who's in a car <coughs> who has been stopped if asked for the uh, his or her it's driver's license or uh, no, no, I'm not talking necessarily the dri well the driver okay let's deal with the driver and then let's deal uh -huh. with the passenger okay. the driver wonder what what obligations are we now at what level are we talking about when we're talking about this car that has been stopped well you're outside of Deboer first of all right and Deboer, Deboer has Deboer to do with street, street encounters. encounters when you're walking if you're talking about a car stop the officer is within his right to ask to see the driver's license of the driver. Now, he would only, uh, an officer would only be entitled to stop you when? Well, if, first of all, if there's a traffic violation, you can be stopped. Or if, let's say, there's, a, there's been a run made on the license plates on the car and they come over one, all right, you can be stopped. Or if, there, if the car registered somebody and the officer has checked and found out there's a warrant for that person or has reason to believe that someone who's wanted by the police is inside the car, the car can be stopped. Or if the officer has reason to believe that there's drugs or a gun or some other contraband in the car, the car can be stopped. It might factually constitute a reasonable belief that there are guns or drugs in the car. Well, if the car, let's say, in the driveway, of a house that's been under surveillance that the police believe is a center for drug trafficking. And that car frequents that sp spot, or it's just seen there one time, leaves within a short period of time, and maybe the people who get in the car are seen carrying a bag. There's enough that the officers may be able to stop that car. Or he has information that are, or he or she has information that uh, that are outside that is outside what the officer is observing. For example, uh, there's a, a report of gunshots um, in an area, and a car is peeling down the street at, at uh, 80 miles an hour, and there are two bullet holes in the back end. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, that's a good reason to stop the car. Well, let me go ahead, Joe. I was going to say, or uh, if you s if um, a call and is made, a car is seen leaving, say, a bank robbery, and the last two digits of a license plate are yes. reported, say, on a white Oldsmobile. White Oldsmobile spotted by the cop, and those two digits are in the license plate. The car is going to be stopped. Let me give you a, a, another another example, and we haven't even gotten to the third and fourth levels mm -hmm. yet. Right. 
um, there's a party. There's a bowl of cocaine in the party. One of the party goers starts to go out of the door, and when he opens the door, 15 million police with guns drawn enter. To steal the cocaine? <laughs> no, okay. I just uh, want to know how the high is going. Uh, presumably to stop the illegal use of, cocaine. of okay. uh, controlled substances. Okay. Um, a particular person is there. Cop comes up to him, puts his gun to his head. Shut up, don't move. Mm -hmm. I know who you are. Come with me. Boom. Mm -hmm. What? Right then and there. Would a person, would an officer have the right to arrest anybody in that room? Absolutely. Everybody. Everybody in the room. Under the law, there's a, um, it's called the room presumption. And it's a statute. The, the legislature enacted it. If there is contraband, either dr uh, drugs or guns or, or any sort of contraband in a room, everyone in the room is automatically presumed to possess that under the law. So that you could have gone to this, you know, this gathering with someone who you just met, who you hardly know, um, and have been invited there, and you walk in, and it's a birthday party, let's say, and you know the birthday person's there, everybody's having a great time, and you go into the back room, and there's the cocaine, and you say, oh my God, that's cocaine, I'm out of here, and two steps later, the cops come, all right? You are presumed to be in possession of that cocaine, and you can't talk your way out of it. The interesting thing is, if the owner of the apartment isn't home when the police come, everybody else in the apartment can be charged with possession, but the owner won't be. That's right. Even though it's his or her apartment. So in this party, uh, this party goer has been arrested, and uh, you know people start getting separated. And uh, this one cop tells person one, you know, person two said that you're the one who got him the really good price on it, you know. Mm -hmm. And if you uh, you know help me out, I think I can I think I can help you out, you know. I think the judge will, the judge will go easy on you if he thinks you're cooperative. You know, Shank, th this. Um, the way, the techniques that police officers use to get statements out of people who are accused of crimes is a whole, we could do an, another show on it. Uh, read the Miranda decision, you know, that decision goes into, you know, good cop, bad cop. Well, a good cop, you're, you're being interrogated and a good cop will come in and say, listen, I just want to warn you, my partner's having trouble with his wife and his kids, he's really in a bad mood, he's been in a bad mood for two days now. Yesterday, I he did something to somebody I don't even want to talk about, so look, just you know, you can tell me, you did this, didn't you? Mm -hmm. And you're Mirandized, right? The first Miranda warning is, you have the right to remain silent. Okay. And then he'll ask you, do you wish to not, uh, to waive that right and tell us the truth? Like, if you assert the right, you're lying. Well, wait a minute, Steve. Usually they tell you all that after they've gotten a statement anyway. That's right, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, so but that's, a, that's another. So we're in this situation, and uh, you know, good cop, bad cop, you know, he's, had a, he's had a rough day. How should I handle it? You shouldn't say anything. Well, how can I just not? I mean, lawyer. The words out of your mouth should be, I want a lawyer, I want a lawyer. I asked like for a, a lawyer. Mantra. Five. That's right. Keep right. champing the lawyer. Mantra. Can I have a lawyer? Yes. Right. Can I, I have a lawyer? lawyer? Now, what, what level of intrusion would that have been when the police burst in to that, uh, that, that room? Oh, well, that's, that's the whole bananas. That's the arrest. That's arrest. Right. Now, would, would they had to have had a warrant? Sometimes. Uh, it depends on how they got the information or how they, for example, if they show up at the door, let's say they saw somebody uh, half an hour or 15 minutes ago take, you know, kilos of cocaine like in a milk crate <laughs> up there, uh, and they follow this person. That's exigent circumstances. They don't need a warrant. When you say exigent, what, what does that word mean? That means they're, it, it's, they're, they're chasing someone, you know. Like well, a hot they basically, they don't have time to go get a warrant. Right. Okay. If, they're, if someone's being chased, which is what they call hot pursuit, Let's say they see a guy with a gun on the street. Actually, I had a case like this. They see a guy with a gun on the street, and they start chasing him. And he runs, allegedly, to his apartment where there's a bowl of cocaine on the kitchen table. Now, we know that's fantasy, but let's say that's their story. Okay, by his running into the apartment, the police are entitled to go into that apartment in search of him, even though they don't have a warrant. Ordinarily, they would not be allowed to do that by law in New York State. 
or if under Steve's scenario, let's say they're just sitting, taking a lunch break, and they notice somebody carrying some speakers for a party and a milk crate of cocaine. Well, they don't have time to go back to the precinct and get a warrant for that. They could go and knock on the door. Or well, let's say there's a report of noise coming from the apartment from a neighbor. And so they get the 911 call about loud noise, and so go to investigate. And when they knock on the door, the door is opened, and they're sitting in front of them is a bowl of cocaine. They don't have to turn around and close their eyes because that cocaine is in plain view. And they can come in and arrest everybody. So we're, we're talking about these four levels of intrusion, and we discussed the first the two first levels, two. Uh, request for information and uh, common law right to inquire. Common law right, right to, to inquire. inquire. Right. Generally explain uh, the third level of intrusion. The third level is what's called a stop and frisk. And um, the level of information that the police officer has to have at this point is there's got to be a, an articulable suspicion, a founded suspicion that the person who is being stopped either committed, is in the process of committing, or has committed a crime. Uh, and, and it's reasonable suspicion. It's not probable cause. And I want to distinguish those two because probable cause means it's probable that you did something rather than I, I, I'm, I'm reasonably suspicious that you're the person who did this. And that stop can mean uh, you know, a pat down for weapons or for contraband, but most of the time it's for weapons. That's the other part of the standard so that the police officer can protect him or herself in case the person has a weapon. But that also that detention can be for you know, other questioning. And it's oftentimes during that place where a person will give up enough information to have them arrested. It's also important to understand that from the outside, a detention and an arrest look very similar. Though usually the only real difference is the handcuffs. Right. Because with the detention, you can be detained for half hour, an hour, two hours. You can even be moved from one spot to another, okay, during the detention. But you're not formally under arrest. But you're not free to go. That's right. No. You're not free to go. Now, from a defense standpoint, a defense lawyer would argue that you're actually arrested at that point, okay? And that, I mean, we'll talk a little bit later about why we would take that tack. But there's not that much distinction between an actual detention and an actual arrest. Now, what kind of information would uh, an officer have in, at this third level of intrusion, which is a uh, stop and reasonable suspicion, stop and frisk? You might meet the general description of a suspect say, let's say for burglary again, 4 o'clock in the morning, the hypo that Steve mm -hmm. used earlier. Uh, what about a, an anonymous phone call? Would that qualify? Oh, well, we're doing to a pretty, um, a, a pretty exacting standard. That's the Aguilar-Spinelli test. Two cases, Aguilar and Spinelli, the name of it doesn't matter. What matters is the information that the police officer has. If it's an anonymous phone call, the Aguilar-Spinelli test says that the information has to be reliable, and that the person who gives the information has to be reliable. So if it's, you know, this is, this is Joe the Rat. I've, uh, I've talked to you before, officer, and I'm telling you now that there's a guy in a red shirt and blue pants, and, and he's got a kilo of cocaine. And you remember the last four tips I gave you uh, resulted in this guy being arrested, OK? They know that I'm reliable. And then they see you walking down the street, and there's this trail of white powder behind you, you know? That means that their information is right. That's both tests are fulfilled. That's probable cause to arrest. Now, let me, let me just talk about those, the recap on the three levels, right? The first mm -hmm. level, which is? Which is the, the uh, request for information. And the second level? The common law right to inquire. And this third level? Stop and frisk. Now, you come up and you, wherever, and, and this is applicable to all three levels. Officer comes to where are you going? Where are you coming from? And I say, uh, oh, I just came from my friend's house. Yeah, we was just listening to music. What's your friend's name? Where does he live? My, my, my friend's name is uh, Abdul. Mm -hmm. He lives right there. Now you, we're right there. You say, come on, let's, let's, go, let's go talk to him. I want to make sure you were there. You know, we had a little report mm -hmm. that, you know, the shots fired in this area. Mm -hmm. And you get there and you find out Abdul don't live there, right? The, part, the place is boarded up. So you conclude that I lied about seeing Abdul in this apartment. Mm -hmm. What does that do with respect to the levels of intrusion? Well, you're on your way to being arrested, probably. Right. 
you know, a defense lawyer would argue that you are under no obligation to tell the officer, to answer the officer's question when he first came to you. Now, whether you're under the obligation to tell the truth once you start telling the officer, that, you know, I don't know if that's been decided. I don't think that you're under mm -hmm. an obligation to Only tell the truth. Only in the feds. Yeah. In the feds, you can't lie to a federal officer. In the state, you're still free to lie to a police officer. So it's better to lie to a federal officer. Mm. No, no, no. To no, a no. state officer. It's better to remain silent. Yeah. Better to remain right. Right. silent at all, at all times. Right. Or, ask, or uh, ask for a lawyer. Absolutely. And ask for a lawyer. Yeah. You know, if the cop says, you know, what are you doing? That's fine. You know, he could probably come up with, with some sort of objective, credible reason to ask you those questions. But when you start answering the questions, and at arraignments, mm -hmm. the people, the prosecutor, I love this people euphemism, the prosecutor has to give a defense lawyer um, the, the essence of a defendant's statements when they're arrested. And it's almost a matter of course that you're going to get a statement. And as a defense lawyer, it drives me crazy to get this statement notice because that means that the person who I'm defending has tried to talk their way out of this. And, and there is no such thing as talking your way out of an encounter with the police. That's why we say stay quiet and ask for a lawyer because there is nothing you can say that's right. going to help you. I mean, the most you can, if you want to go that far, ask if you're free to leave because that establishes it for you. You're, if the officer says, no, you're not, you're under arrest, and that establishes it in no uncertain mm -hmm. terms. So, so the officer will usually say, shut up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So one of the first things. And that's a clue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's <laughs> a little hint yeah, that you're, you're really free to leave. Intimidation. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, let me give you another scenario. Or uh, there's a car, there's a car, there's some people in the car, uh, broken tail light, so they get stopped. One of the people in the car drops a weapon, like pushes it up under the seat in front of him, mm -hmm. or puts it somewhere. They have right, they have permission to search in only visual search from outside the car. Now back to reality. They ask everybody to step out of the car, and they tear that car apart, looking for something. Then they'll come up with an excuse as to why that was justified. They may say they found rolling papers in the pocket of one of the occupants of the car. Or they thought they saw one of the occupants of the car doing a furtive movement, pushing something, which made them think that some contraband was being hidden in the car. You know, I saw him, I saw the passenger or a person in the back seat bend over as if they were sliding something under mm -hmm. the seat. This from is my well, from I'm 50 sorry. yards back and, and their headrest so that you can't see anything. The person in the back kept looking back at the police car. Oh, that's a great one. Right. With a sign that says, there's a gun in here. Right. Yeah. Well, now, let me, let me ask you about, about those rolling papers. Okay. Would, would rolling papers be uh, a reason to escalate through the, the, uh, the, the levels of, of, of search? Well, they helped to corroborate the officer's claim of having a suspicion that there was something criminal going on because rolling papers are used to roll marijuana, and of course they're also used to roll tobacco. Yeah, I'm not even sure whether rolling papers fall under the, the uh, possession of drug paraphernalia, paraphernalia. statute. I'm, I'm not sure. So. It's, there's a list of things that fall under it, like baggies and little glass vials. Well, they can say know. they thought they smelled burning marijuana. Right. Or it's marijuana that's not burning. I had a case where, where a police officer said, uh, smelled I smelled it. marijuana, and this marijuana was in plastic bags, in uh, paper bags, in a knapsack, under a seat. And he, sm he smelled unburning marijuana because he was trained to smell marijuana that hadn't been burning, if you believe that. This is uh, Shank for Pro Se Views, sitting here with uh, Stephen Scott and Jill Safia Elijah with a special edition of Pro Se Views, Police Confrontation Training. Uh, you should call the National Lawyers Guild or call Pro Se Views and uh, find out more about the four levels of intrusions, what your rights are with respect to the police and in any confrontation. You could fill hours. <laughs> what is Brady B. Texas? I don't know. <laughs> Lock it. Now the other one, the other one, the other two little ones in the front. DWB.
the little ones, the two little knobs. Yeah, you, you got, you see it? No, no, no. The, this one is one. the one behind, the little things behind that. 